As dawn broke over Muri, an air of unease settled over the village like a heavy blanket. The news of Amara's true nature had spread rapidly, whispered from hut to hut in the dark hours of the night. By the time the sun peaked over the horizon, painting the sky in hues of pink and gold, every adult in Mori knew the shocking truth, or at least what they believed to be the truth. Amara, oblivious to the storm brewing around her, emerged from her hut as she did every morning. She balanced her basket of fruits on her head, the vibrant colors of mangoes, guavas, and oranges, a stark contrast to the somber mood that had descended upon the village. As she made her way to the market, she couldn't help but notice the strange looks and hushed whispers that followed her. Good morning, she said softly to Adana, the elderly woman whose stall neighbored hers. But instead of the usual grunt of acknowledgement, Adana turned away, making the sign to ward off evil spirits. Confused and hurt, Amara set up a stall in silence. The market, usually a bustling hive of activity by this hour, was eerily quiet. People moved about their business with unusual haste, avoiding eye contact with Amara and giving her stall a wide berth. It was Chidi who finally approached her, his face etched with concern. Amara, he said in a low voice, something's happened. The elders, they know. Amara's heart sank, her worst fears confirmed. Know what, Chidi? she asked, clinging to the last shreds of her secret. Chidi leaned in closer, his voice barely above a whisper. They know what you are. Namdi, he saw you last night, at the river. The world seemed to tilt beneath Amara's feet. She gripped the edge of her stool to steady herself, her mind racing. How could she have been so careless? Before she could formulate a response, a commotion at the edge of the market caught their attention. Obiora, flanked by the other village elders, was making his way towards Amara's stall. The crowd parted before them, a sea of curious and fearful faces. Amara, Obiora's voice boomed across the market, silencing the murmurs of the onlookers. You will come with us now. The Council of Elders demands your presence. Abo. Amara straightened her back, lifting her chin despite the fear that threatened to overwhelm her. Of course, Elder Obiora, she said, her voice steady despite her internal turmoil. As she moved to follow the elders, Chidi caught her arm. I'll come with you, he said, his eyes filled with determination. Obiora frowned, but didn't object as Chidi fell into step beside Amara. Together they followed the elders to the grand Iroko tree at the center of the village, where important meetings and judgments had been held for generations. The villagers gathered around, forming a wide circle. At the center stood Amara, with Chidi slightly behind her, facing the semicircle of elders. Obiora stepped forward, his weathered face grave. Amara, he began, his voice carrying across the hushed crowd. You stand accused of deceiving this village, of living among us under false pretenses, of being... He paused, as if the words were difficult to say. A creature of the water, a mermaid. A gasp rippled through the crowd. Amara stood still, her face a mask of calm, despite the tempest of emotions raging within her. What do you say to these accusations? Obiora demanded. Amara took a deep breath, her gaze sweeping across the faces of the people she had lived among for years. She saw fear, curiosity, and in some faces, like Chidi's, concern and compassion. I say, Amara began, her voice clear and strong, that while it's true, I am not what I appear to be. I have never meant any harm to this village or its people. 
murmurs broke out among the crowd. Obiora held up a hand for silence. You admit, then, that you are indeed a... mermaid? Amara nodded slowly. I am. My father is the king of the river people, and my mother the queen. But I am also human. I live between two worlds, with love for both. Why? It was Ardaku who spoke now. Her eyes filled with a mixture of fear and fascination. Why live among us, pretending to be human? I wasn't pretending, Amara said softly. This is as much a part of me as my life in the river. I wanted to understand your world, to be a bridge between land and water. Is that so wrong? Before anyone could respond, a commotion broke out at the edge of the gathering. A young boy pushed his way through the crowd, his face streaked with tears. Please, he cried. Someone help. My father. He's collapsed in the fields. The accusatory atmosphere dissipated instantly as concern for one of their own took precedence. Obiora turned to Namdi, the youngest of the elders. Go, see what has happened. As Namdi hurried away with the boy, Obiora turned back to Amara. This isn't over. You will remain here until we decide what to do with you. But Amara's attention was elsewhere. Her keen ears had picked up snippets of conversation from the dispersing crowd. Words like crops failing, stores running low, and famine reached her. The shadow that had been looming over Maurice was no longer just a threat. It had arrived. As the hours passed, more reports came in. Farmers returning from the fields spoke of withered crops and dry riverbeds. The signs were clear. Mori was on the brink of a devastating famine. The elders reconvened, this time to discuss the impending crisis. Amara, still under watch, sat at the edge of the gathering, her mind racing. She knew she could help. But would they accept assistance from someone they now saw as an outsider? A creature to be feared? It was Chidi who finally spoke up. Elders, he said, his voice respectful but firm. I know you have concerns about Amara, but right now our village faces a greater threat. Perhaps, perhaps Amara's unique abilities could be of help? Obiora frowned, but Adaku nodded slowly. The boy speaks sense, she said. We cannot afford to turn away any help, no matter its source. All eyes turned to Amara. She stood, her posture straight and dignified. I can help, she said simply. Let me go to the river tonight. I promise you, by morning, there will be food for the village. Suspicion warred with desperation on the faces of the elders. Finally, Obiora nodded. Very well, he said grudgingly. But you will be watched. And if this is some trick... It's not, Amara assured him. I give you my word. As night fell, Amara made her way to the river, acutely aware of the ice watching her from the shadows. At the water's edge, she paused, turning to face the hidden observers. What you're about to see may frighten you, she said clearly. But please, remember that I am still Amara. I am still the same person who has lived among you all these years. With that, she stepped into the water. The transformation was quick. In moments, where Amara had stood, a mermaid now swam, her tail gleaming in the moonlight. Without another word, she dove beneath the surface. In the underwater palace, Amara quickly explained the situation to her parents. King Olauda and Queen Adana listened gravely, then nodded their assent to her plan. You have a good heart, my daughter, Queen Adana said, embracing Amara. Go, help your land-dwelling friends, but be cautious. Humans can be unpredictable when faced with things they don't understand. Throughout the night, Amara and a group of her mer people kin worked tirelessly. 
They gathered fish from the deepest parts of the river, harvested underwater plants rich in nutrients, and collected pearls and other treasures that could be traded for food from neighboring villages. As the first light of dawn touched the eastern sky, Amara emerged from the river. On the bank, piled high, was enough food to feed Mori for weeks. Strings of pearls lay beside the foodstuffs, a gift to help the village through the hard times ahead. The villagers, who had gathered at the river's edge as word of Amara's activities spread, stared in awe at the bounty before them. Amara, back in her human form but still dripping with river water, stood beside the pile of food. This is my gift to Muri, she said, her voice carrying clearly in the dawn stillness. There is more where this came from. I can teach you to fish in new ways, to cultivate plants that thrive in drought. I can be a bridge between your world and mine bringing the best of both to help us all thrive. She turned to face Obiora and the other elders. I know you fear what I am, but judge me not by the tail I wear in water, but by the actions I take on land and sea. I love this village. It is as much my home as the river. Please, let me help. Let me be a part of this community. All of me, human and mermaid alike. A hush fell over the gathered villagers. The fate of Amara, and perhaps of Moor itself, hung in the balance. As the sun rose fully over the horizon, bathing the scene in golden light, the village stood at a crossroads. Would they embrace Amara and the aid she offered, or would fear drive them to reject her and face the famine alone? The decision that followed would shape the future of Mori for generations to come. The silence that followed Amara's impassioned plea was deafening. The villagers of Mori stood frozen, their gazes darting between the pile of food on the riverbank, the dripping form of Amara, and the stern faces of the elders. The fate of both Amara and the village hung in the balance, teetering on the knife edge between acceptance and rejection. It was Chidig who finally broke the silence. Stepping forward, he moved to stand beside Amara, his presence a silent show of support. Elders, he said, his voice clear and strong. I have known Amara since my return to Muri. In all that time, I have seen nothing but kindness and generosity from her. She has lived among us peacefully for years, and now... In our time of greatest need, she offers us salvation. How can we turn our backs on such a gift? Murmurs rippled through the crowd. Obiora's frown deepened, but before he could speak, Adaku, the female elder, stepped forward. Her wise eyes swept over the gathered villagers before settling on Amara. Child, she said, her voice gentle but firm. You have lived a life divided keeping secrets from those around you. Yet in our hour of need, you reveal yourself and offer aid. Tell me, why should we trust you now? Amara met Adaku's gaze steadily. Because, Elder, she replied, this village has been my home as much as the river. I have laughed with you at festivals, mourned with you at funerals. I have watched children grow and elders pass on. My secret was not born of malice, but of fear. Fear that you would not understand, that you would reject me if you knew the truth. But I can no longer stand by and watch my land family suffer when I have the power to help. Her words seemed to resonate with many in the crowd. Nods and murmurs of agreement could be seen and heard, but Obiora remained unconvinced. Pretty words, he scoffed, but words nonetheless. How do we know this isn't some trick? Some way to lure us into complacency before you and your river people attack. A gasp went up from the crowd at the accusation. Amara's eyes widened in shock, 
but before she could respond, an unexpected voice rang out. Enough! All eyes turned to see Nkechi, the village's oldest resident and most respected herbalist, making her way through the crowd. Despite her advanced age, she moved with purpose, her eyes blazing with an inner fire. Obiora, Nkechi said, her voice carrying the weight of years. Your fear blinds you. Have you forgotten the stories of our ancestors? The tales of river spirits who brought bounty in times of need? Of alliances between land and water that brought prosperity to both? She turned to face the gathered villagers. I have lived long enough to see the folly of rejecting that which we do not understand. Amara has lived among us, has been one of us, for years. She has harmed no one. And now, when famine threatens to destroy all we hold dear, she offers us hope. And Keichi's words seemed to break the spell of fear that had gripped the village. One by one, villagers began to step forward, sharing stories of Amara's kindness over the years. How she had helped an old man carry his heavy load. How she had comforted a child who had lost her pet. How her fruits had often been given freely to those who couldn't afford to pay. As the stories flowed, the atmosphere began to shift. Fear gave way to curiosity. Suspicion to tentative acceptance. Even Obiora's stern expression began to soften. Finally, Adaku spoke again. Amara, she said, you have offered us food and aid, but I would ask one thing more of you. Show us. Amara tilted her head, puzzled. Show you what, Elder? Show us who you truly are, Adaku clarified. Let us see the daughter of the River King and Queen. Let us truly know you as you truly are. A hush fell over the crowd once more. Amara glanced at Chidi, who gave her an encouraging nod. Taking a deep breath, she turned and walked into the river. As the water reached her waist, she dove beneath the surface. For a moment, nothing happened. Then, with a splash that sent droplets of water glittering in the morning sun, Amara emerged. Her powerful tail propelled her partly out of the water, giving everyone a clear view of her transformation. Iridescent scales shimmered where legs had been, and her hair, now free of its usual braid, floated around her like a dark cloud. Gasps of awe echoed from the shore. Children pointed in wonder, their fear forgotten in the face of such magic. Even Obiora's eyes widened in amazement. Amara swam closer to the shore, careful to stay in water deep enough to support her. This is who I am, she said, her voice carrying clearly across the water. Daughter of the land and the river, born of two worlds. I offer myself as a bridge between these worlds to bring prosperity and understanding to both. There was a moment of profound silence as her words sank in. Then... Slowly at first, but with growing enthusiasm, the villagers began to clap and cheer. The fear that had gripped Mori began to dissipate, replaced by a sense of wonder and hope. Obiora, seeing the change in his people, finally nodded. Very well, he said, his voice gruff, but no longer hostile. Amara, daughter of land and river, Mori accepts your gift and your offer of help. But know this, you will be watched. Any sign of betrayal, any hint that you mean us harm, and this acceptance will be revoked. Amara nodded solemnly. I understand, Elder Obiora. You will see that your trust is not misplaced. As the villagers began to move the food from the riverbank into the village, Amara swam to shore and transformed back into her human form. Chidi was there to meet her, a broad smile on his face. You did it, he said, handing her a cloth to dry off. You've opened their eyes. 
Amara returned his smile, relief and joy washing over her. We've taken the first step, she agreed. But there's still much work to be done. Over the weeks that followed, Amara worked tirelessly to help Muri through the famine. She taught the villagers new fishing techniques, showing them how to find fish in the deepest parts of the river where they had never ventured before. She introduced them to nutritious water plants that could be cultivated along the riverbank, providing a steady source of food even in times of drought. More than that, she began to bridge the gap between her two worlds with the blessing of her underwater. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed watching. Kindly click the subscribe button, like, comment, and share this video. Watch out for more intriguing and eye-catching videos from your favorite YouTube channel.